everyone. Here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I am online and glad to be with you today, full of the joy of the Lord today. I've got a, I've got a bunch of things to take care of today, and I'm just going to rush right into it without a lot of chit-chat. Um, a lady wrote me an email earlier today, and I really appreciated it, and I thought it was worthy enough to go ahead and share with everybody today, even though she wants me to keep. Uh, there's a part of this that I'm not going to read that is anonymous. It's a prayer request that she's sending me as her pastor, and I don't. Uh, I'm I'm just going to keep that. But anyway, you just just say, Lord, this lady has a need in her life and her family. Lord, would you please bless this lady? And God knows who it's talking about because God can see through my eyes and see the name that I have here on the screen. Anyway, uh, it's pertaining to. Um, the broadcast we did Tuesday and the topic that we were talking about, and I've dealt with this several times, and I'm just telling you right now, I'm going to deal with it a bunch more times. I, I, sit, I sat last night uh, before church and was just studying some things out pertaining to the law and keeping the law and so on and just making some notes there, and uh, I'm going to be dealing with it again as long as there is an attack by the enemy, to, and there is. There's an attack by our enemy to try to steal away and take away the grace of God and the Word of God, which is what we're going to deal with today. Then I'm going to counter back. I'm going to get my shield of faith out and my helmet of salvation on, and I'm going to go to war with these people. Um, <clears throat> but she said, she said about Hebrew roots, uh, she said, I have a little bit different perspective for me. Uh, what's neat is what the Hebrew cultural information is all about. I, it just adds more depth to my faith. Learning about the feast is one example. It's neat to see the way all of that points to Jesus, and I agree with that. Also, I have had an unexplained fascination of the Hebrew language since I was in early my early 20s. I don't know why. I just think it's cool. I agree with that, too. I would, I would like to learn uh, to speak Hebrew. I would like to learn to read and speak and understand the Hebrew language. I, I think it would be neat. Um, to use it to change the Bible would be a sin, uh, but to learn it, it, it is a. I think it's a beautiful language. Uh, even the ch that's in there, I, okay, it's, it has its own beauty. All right, um, and so here's what she continued to say. Several years ago, I decided to quit eating pork and other scavenger animals after reading uh, somebody's book. I won't even say who that is. Uh, he presented what the Bible says and what science says. My choosing to avoid these animals wasn't out of any thoughts of legalism. Instead, I just believe that God didn't make those animals as food for us, but instead for our for cleanup patrol. I figured that uh, since he made us, he also knows what is healthy for us and what isn't. The Bible indicates that certain animals are not food, so I just take it at face value. What about circumcising on the eighth day? Isn't that when the clotting factors peak? Again, I have heard that, and I, I would agree with that. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I just think there is a definite benefit to taking what God said at face value. No argument from El Maiko at all. I, I would agree with the principle, and I appreciate the fact um, that um, she put in here about not being legalistic. And I have, I have tried to say and tell people that if you are choosing to follow the Jewish way of life, um, for whatever reason, well, I won't say for whatever reason, but just out of a curiosity, a fascination, this is what fits you, then so be it. Um, I would that everybody learn how to be Americans and eat a hamburger and a hot dog and drink uh, sweet tea with ice in it and um, have barbecues and play football and baseball. I mean, yeah. And learn how to say, hey, y'all, Joe, go, did y'all go the race track the other night? I mean, that's, I, I think it would be neat if everybody in the world was like Americans. And so I don't, I don't have a problem with people from other countries adopting the American way of life. In fact, I think that if you come to America, you ought to learn how to sprechen the Deutsch for crying out loud. Uh, so I certainly don't have any, uh, any problem with someone adopting that particular lifestyle. My whole point is this, is that there are some very, very evil people out there at the core of a lot of these Hebrew roots, get-togethers and everything like that, and they are wolves in, dressed up like Jewish sheep. 
That's what they are, and they're out to steal souls is what they're doing. And I just, I, it's, it should come with, it. and I'll tell you, anybody who wants to come to America, I'll, I'll show you all the good places. I'll show you all the nice, clean places. I'll show you where the good places are to eat. I'll show you places where you can go and hang out and camp out and whatever you want to do. I will also warn you about the bad places and the bad things in America, and don't trust this. My son-in-law, Michael, was uh, he admitted to me he was very protective of me when we went to Kenya uh, last year. He wouldn't. I would say, Michael, can I eat that? No, no, don't eat that. Don't eat that. Don't stay away from there. Don't go over there. Don't go over here. Don't do this. Don't do that. He admitted it. He said, maybe I was a little overprotective. I said, hey, don't worry about it. Uh, but anyway, so I appreciate that email, and I just wanted to uh, clear that up. Now there is a picture that I wanted to show you that several people have sent to me. This uh, Apparently this is in uh, Times Square, maybe, I think. Let me pull it up here. Um, it was uh, It's a billboard put up by the American Atheist Society. Um, and it features Satan claws on the top and Jesus dying on the cross. And up at the top with Satan claws, it says, keep the Mary. And then below with Jesus dying on a cross, it says, dump the myth. And I'm going, this is the stupidest. I, I mean, the Bible is so right. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. This has got to be the dumbest Foolish, most foolish thing that I have seen in the last 15 minutes. I've seen some other things that probably are close to this in the last half hour. But this is the dumbest, most foolish thing that I have seen in the last 15 minutes. There, It's like Jesus, or like Satan Claus is real, and Jesus is the stupid myth that you shouldn't believe in. I mean, here is the Savior of all mankind who died on the cross, whose sole purpose in coming was to suffer and to be abused and tortured and hung on a cross and and um, mocked and shamed in front of mankind. And he did it on purpose. Why? To save foolish people from their foolish ways. To save ungodly people. To save sinners of whom I am chief, Paul said. And he did it out of love. And the, the atheist of this world... Don't mind you believing and celebrating Satan Claus, a mythological person who everybody in the world knows does not exist unless you watch all the movies, like Miracle in 34th Street and the Santa Claus and all of these movies now that are, that are actually trying to convince you that Santa Claus is real, and we know that he's not. I, rem I remember thinking when I was a child, it doesn't make sense to me. Because we didn't have a real fireplace in the house that I that, that I first remember living in, just south of Arnold, Missouri, just north of here. We had my mom put up one of those fake cardboard fireplaces. I don't know if you remember those fake cardboard card uh, fireplace with a little light in it behind the fake cardboard wood with a little thing that spun around when the light warmed up, and it make it look like it was glowing. And I would look at that and go, how's he get in there? I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I don't understand how he gets in there. And then it never made sense to me how, how uh, Mr. Claus wrapped all of those presents in my living room without me hearing it or without anybody hearing it. It just didn't make, I mean, I wanted to believe and sure enough, the next day I woke up, half the milk was gone, bites taken out of the cookie that I left. But it just, just some things just didn't add up. And so I remember, I, I can't remember if it's my mom or dad or my sister or somebody, but there was just the realization, oh, it's, he's not real. Ah, now it's all starting to click together now. He just doesn't exist. But the American Atheist Society and the agnostics, which, do you know what the word agnostic means? It's the Greek word agonosko. Gnosko means I know. I know this. Agonosko, the little ah in front of it, it's kind of like ah, millennial. 
You ask any all millennial, do you believe in the mil millennium? And they go, eh. So an agonosco is a, eh, I don't know. It's, it's where we get the word ignorant. It's where we get the word. So an agnostic is ignorant, is what they are. And they put ignorant stuff like this up and, and boast of their ignorance to everybody in the whole world. Yeah, we believe in Santa Claus. We don't believe in that Jesus. Oh, that's a bunch of nonsense. Makes me mad. And then the video that everybody's been talking about, and uh, I just got to show it to you. Go, I mean, go back and watch like every Watchmen video broadcast I've done in the last four years. Uh, because here it is all wrapped up in a Verizon Android commercial. The fusion of electronics and the human being. Uh, I did a video called What is the Singularity? Um, and several others that we've, that we've done. Just, just the, ra the random news that we go through every week is all about what technology now is able to do as far as linking in with the human body. And you and I both know, well, Ray Kurzweil. Time Magazine, Ray Kurzweil, gets on there and says, by 2045, we're going to be immortal, which means, which means, according to the Bible, we're going to be gods. Compare Genesis chapter 3 with 1 Corinthians 15. This mortal must put on immortality. That's when you and I will be elevated out of this life to the, the spiritual realm as the angels, as angelic beings, we will be and I know this bothers some people, but we will be the body of Christ. Hence, we will be joint heirs with Jesus. Hence, we will be like him as he is. Some people have a big hang up with that, but that's just clearly what the Bible teaches. But there is the opposite way of doing this. And that is through changing DNA, biology, mingling with technology, and it's the singularity, and we're moving on a course of making men into gods, and here is the commercial that promotes it. Watch this. Introducing Droid DNA by HTC. It's not an upgrade to your phone, it's an upgrade to yourself. Droid. Whoa, Droid. We're headed there, man. Get ready to be the inferior human that will not take the mark. Get ready. Because the superheroes who, have, who are going to do all this stuff are going to be better than you. They're going to be gods, and they're, that's I believe that's where part of the persecution is going to come. The other persecution, and I have said this for years, and I, I want you to I want you to really listen today, take notes. I I have this all in a PowerPoint uh, that I put together t this morning. I, I recorded the second part of the Watchmen broadcast this morning. Uh, I've just been a little, busy little beaver today. And I got done, and I came in here and started working on. I've got about 18 slides to go through, and I want you to listen carefully, and I want you to take a lot of notes. Um, let me put my microphone up a little bit. There we get some more volume. Um, you and I are in danger. You and I are in danger. Number one, we, we are going to, we're going to be the resistors. We are not going to take the technology. Now, I've got, I mean, I am Mr. Techno Guy at Bethel Church. Um, everything around here operates on technology that I have put in place. Uh, it's just a, it's an interest of mine. It's like a hobby. I sit and I fool with computers. I will load a Linux distribution onto my computer just to, just for something to do, just to play with it. Uh, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Uh, but that's me, and I've got my iPhone, my iPad, my I, I got computers everywhere, all over me. They're just not in me, and I think that's where I would probably uh, draw the line. Um, but anyway, we we are in a technological society, and the technocracy is going to take over one of these days, no doubt in my mind. So a certain amount of, of persecution is going to come from the gods 
who are going to say you you worthless puny human you're not you're not worthy to live on this earth um the other person and you're dangerous because you won't take that the other persecution i believe is going to come has already and is right now coming from the pulpits and the doorways of the church or the churches i'll say it that way the real church we don't persecute each other um but from the the pulpits and the doorways of the churches in in america in this in this in this world because you are dangerous because there you need there are two spirits in this world that are working against each other the spirit of truth the spirit of christ the the spirit of god um, the spirit of the scripture, the inspiration of the scriptures, and there, then there is the the spirit of this world, the God of this world, the uh, the the father of all lies, the uh, the serpent, the deceiver. Um, they are they are, there is enmity according to Genesis three. They are working against each other, and whatever spirit you have in you. You are going to follow the leadership of that spirit, and you are going to work against the other spirit. It's I'll, I'll put it to you like um, like Ahab and and or excuse not Ahab and Jezebel, but uh, Elijah and Jezebel. They uh, they had purpose to destroy one another. Elijah knew what he was getting into when he first started dealing with Jezebel. He knew it. Um, and even so, he ended up, after the whole deal, even winning the contest, he ended up running away, licking his wounds, and saying, okay, God, I'm done here. Take me away. I don't want to live anymore. That's, I mean, and I'll tell you, when you deal with Jezebel, that's what you, that's what you feel like doing. Okay, I, I fought that battle. It's like fighting Leviathan. I don't ever want to do that again. Um, and Jezebel certainly knew who she was up against, and the fact that her prophets lost did not change her one bit. She did not say, oh my goodness, Baal is not God. I'm going to worship Jehovah. She didn't do that. She said, I'll kill him if it's the last thing I'll do. I'll have him dead if it's the last thing I do. So there, there, there lies the two spirits. A, um, a video it came across my way. Some of you have seen it. Some of you have sent it to me, and I appreciate that. This ministry operates on the fact that I'm not the only one with eyeballs out there. You guys are the ones with binoculars and telescopes and, and microscopes. You're looking everywhere, and then you're sending it to me. Pastor Mike, what do you think about this? Uh, one of my problems is that sometimes that's overwhelming. I don't know how to handle the volume of information that comes in all the time, but I try to do my best. Certainly, I, there's no way I could answer Every email that's sent to me, there's just no way I could. But what I try, I use the technology, and um, I try to, the, the things that you send me that I find interesting, uh, I use an app called uh, Evernote. And when you send me an email or something like that, and I've, I find it interesting, I copy and paste and make an Evernote out of it, and it sends it to the cloud, and the cloud comes down here. You know, any place I can get access to a computer, I have that information, and I, I like that. That's, that helps me work. Uh, and so this video was sent to me. This is a fellow by the name of John Piper. Now, I went to John Piper's website. Um, here is his website. Uh, it's called DesiringGod.org. There's his phone number if you want to call him. Uh, go ahead. I dare you to call him. See what he says. Um, the logo is interesting to me, but I'm, I, I'm just going to say, well, you know what? I'm not going to make too much of the logo. Uh, and by the way, if you, don't, if you don't understand all about symbols yet, um, what you're looking at is, is the center point. It's the idea of the center point. And you say, well, it's, no, it's a cross. No, that's not a cross. That is the center point. You have all of the arrows pointing in toward the center. Have you ever, um, have you ever, have you ever done meditation? Have you ever done yoga? Have you ever done any kind of martial arts or anything like that where they tell you you've got to center yourself? 
wax on, wax off. You have to you have to get in the center, or you'll hear you'll hear the gurus, or you'll hear the the meditation experts or whatever say, "Now find your center. Now get down to the center, the center point. The center point is basically it's like the core of the labyrinth or the maze. There's there's a god in there. There is a spiritual force and entity at the center point." The cross point, that's why all those churches now are calling themselves cross point or center point. Because there is a there is an energy, a divine energy at the divine center of every human being. The spark of divinity is what it is. It's Gnosticism. And at that core, if you can tap into the center of that, if you can go down deep now, down way, way, way down, and tap into that and release that, then you can have all this God stuff in your life. That's a false gospel. It's paganism. It's witchcraft, it's sorcery, it's, con- it's contacting familiar spirits, and, oh, by the way, you're going to be partly responsible for releasing the Antichrist one of these days. And I'm going to show you that. But aside from what I know about the language of symbols, I can say all that, and this organization is, you know, may just be a great organization trying to spread the gospel, and they just, out of ignorance, because they don't know what I know, they may have, out of ignorance, picked this particular symbol. I don't think so. So let's get the idea of the symbol away, and let's look at, again, let's let's look at what comes out of their mouth, and let's understand the spirit behind what they said, and there is, and it's, you have to decide, is this the Holy Spirit of God, or is this the spirit of this world, the God of this world, and they it has to be one or the other, but it cannot be both. It cannot be a mixture of both because God does not have communion with the devil. Christ did not come in concord with Belial. They don't get along. They are at enmity together. Your flesh is at enmity with your spirit, and you know it. You probably dealt with it today. I know I have today. I've had to deal with my flesh today. This this is kind of a rough day for me, and if you have followed my tweets, you know why. Uh, And I tweeted earlier about the fact that I, I, I asked the question, are there pastors who are secretly trying to remove the King James Bible out of churches and replace it with something else? Is that happening? And um, I saw some of the comments on Facebook, and, and this guy said, uh, uh, they're not doing it secretly. That's like they're blatant about it. Well, I will tell you, some of them are doing it very subtly and very secretly, and I remember several years ago I was reading um, a blog by Free Will Baptist Pastors. That's the denomination that we came out of. A blog by Free Will Baptist Pastors. And one of the blog headings, or it wasn't a blog, what was it? It was a ch- discussion group. One of the discussion points was how to get your church out of the King James Bible. And I was just, my jaw dropped. I was stunned. And I'm reading what pastors, some of these guys, I knew who they were. And I'm reading from pastors about how they were telling other pastors, well, this is, see, this is how you do it. You, you, it, it and one pastor oh, after another was saying, yeah, I went to this church. I got hired by this church, and they used the King James, and I want to get them out of that King James. So I want to get them in the NIV and the, all the other Bibles. I want to get them in that, but they're stuck on that King James, and I want to get them out. Well, listen, if that church pastor is not compatible with you, because you use all these other Bibles and they're using the King James, get out. Why don't you leave, you coward? Or why don't you get up behind the pulpit? Why didn't you get up there when you were when you were trying out to preach at that church? Why didn't you get up behind the pulpit and say, now I know you guys are King James only, but I want to tell you something. I stand on the NIV and the Alexandrian text and the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus text. That's what I stand on. And if you can't handle that, then you shouldn't have me as your pastor. But that's not what they did. They hired on at that church. And then they, then they decided, well, I don't like this King James only stuff. And so they decided now that they were going to remove that church away from the King James Bible. How in the world can we do it? And so one pastor is writing in. He said, well, here's, here's what I did. Here's what I did. I, I started, you know, I'll use the King James. But he said, then what I do is every now and then, he said, I want you to listen to this. I want you to take notes on this, people. Listen to this. Listen to what this pastor said. 
what I started doing was just slowly but surely, I started you know reading out of the King James, putting my notes in King James, and then slowly but surely, here's what I said. Now, another translation says this, or or according to the original Greek or Hebrew, it says this. That is step one. It is. I'm telling you, people, listen to me. It is step number one. That pastor was telling these other pastors, here's how you do it. Step one, read the King James, and then every now and then in your message, say, now, in, in, according to the original Greek, here's what it says, or I like, the other tra- I like another translation that says it this way. That's step number one. And then they proceeded to how, how you do the other steps. But they said, you, you know, basically, you can't just go in there and say, uh, we're all going to use the NIV here. I hope you don't have a problem with it. If you do, get out. They don't do that. They do it subtly, sneakily, snake in the grass like. So you have to ask yourself, what spirit is that? Here's the video by John Piper. And he's asking the question, because people have asked him, how can a pastor move his church from the King James Bible to other translations? Here's the video. How can a pastor respectfully and lovingly move his congregation from the King James Version to a better translation? Better translation. I want you to remember that. I do think there are better translations. Better in the sense of... Uh, just as accurate and more helpful. Like the King James was a magnificent gift to the church for 300 years and still is a gift. But uh, I think the New Testament and Old Testament were written in common language, not uh, formal, educated, literary language, and therefore the Bible should be in ordinary English, German, French, Swahili, not 300-year-old stilted English, French, German, Swahili. And so we need new translations from time to time. And how is the question here? And I would say be totally respectful of the King James and teach, I mean number one, teach on what I just said. That how does language work? And three, don't insist that the people who love the King James need to leave it. Leave it. I'll, I'll allude to it. I'll, I'll refer to it as, as we put in our pews, the ESV or whatever we're going to use, and I'm going to preach from this. So I think respect and letting them keep their versions and teaching on the nature of language and then pursue a uh, a groundswell of support. Don't don't come in as a pastor and say from now on we'll only read, we'll only do, we'll only memorize single-handedly. Why are we going to do that? Rather try to get, get the elders on board first and see get your Sunday school teachers and then try to just move and it may take you a few years to do that you don't need to switch right away you 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 understand what he just said he just said everything that i just told you in fact we didn't need john piper but this is out of this is out of their own mouth and basically what he was saying was number one use gradualism talk like you respect them sweet talk them tell them that we need a better we need a better bible and notice at the, at the start, he said, oh, the King James, it's wonderful. It's so wonderful. It's a, it's a gift to us. It's, a, it's wonderful. But we need a better one. Now, I want you to remember everything he said, because everything that he said came right out of the Bible, not by way of his doctrine is correct, but God exposed John Piper thousands of years ago. And so he said, basically, smooth your way in, talk like you respect it, talk you, you can't, you can't, you can't come in and take a stand on your false Bible. You can't do that. So you got to slip in, and this is how we're going to do it. And then eventually, if you you watched his body language, 
His body language was telling you the picture that he was painting in his mind. He's making gestures like this with his arms. You know what he's doing? Eventually, you're going to take those people in your church who are still stuck in the King James, and you're going to surround them with people who don't believe it anymore. That's what he was doing. That was what it was in his mind, and that's what he said, and that's the, that was the picture he was drawing for you. We're going we're gonna to surround them so that they're going to feel bad because they can't really be part of the church because we don't believe the King James Bible anymore. You sitting out here watching me, many of you have had the exact same thing happen to you. You were ostracized, you were surrounded, you were told that you're in the minority, you were told that nobody believes that, you were, you were called a conspiracy idiot, you were called a, um, a troublemaker, you were told that you were an idol worshiper, an occultist, and everything else because you believe the King James Bible. And the pastor stood back and let it happen. All he had to do was convince a majority of people that this was the way everything was going, and they surrounded you, and you either, you either come into us or get out. And that's how it happens. Let me show you this from the King James, God exposed this spirit thousands of years ago. When, when, the, when I was listening to this video and I heard him say, you need a, we, we, we need a better one. I knew exactly where this had come from. I'm going to put it up on the screen, but I want you to take notes on this and I want you to open your, uh, open your can of King James Bible. And uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, Reg Kelly, and I, w I wish that I could find this sermon that he preached. I had it on a cassette tape, and I don't know where it is. It's called Don't Sell Your Vineyard. One of the most outstanding messages I think I've ever heard on this issue. You know what? I, maybe I do have that. Maybe we have, we, maybe we have that. There's another one that I, that I wish I had, and I, don't, I can't find it. But he preached this. First time I ever met Reg, he preached this, and I was just, I was just amazed at the analogy he was making, and he was dead on. And I'm going to show it to you from the Scripture. 1 Kings chapter 21, look, look at what the Bible says. Uh, and it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard. Now I want you to think of the vine. I want you to think of the vine because that's the picture that God is painting for you. That Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, Hard by the palace of Ahab, king Samaria, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy, now this word vineyard, and I'm going to show you that we're, we're not actually taking liberties with the scriptures. Take the word vineyard, and there's lots of vineyards. So it's the inheritance. Naboth had his inheritance here. So you can, you can put salvation, you can put uh, your inheritance, the eternal life, you can, put, um, you can put your family and your family name and your family honor, you can put that in there. Uh, you can put your personal character in there. But right now, I want, you to, I want you to see that word vineyard as Bible. Give me thy Bible. Give me Naboth your King James Bible from the true vine. Nahab spoke unto Nabal, saying, Give me thy vineyard, your Bible, that I may have it for a garden of herbs. In other words, I'm going to transform it, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it, listen, look at what he promised him, a better vineyard than it. Or, if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give thee the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. I can't wait to meet Naboth in heaven and hug his neck and shake his hand and tell him thank you. Thank you from someone who admired you and admired your stand for your ground. That's the whole thing of standing your ground. Naboth stood his ground. 
And I want to tell you something. I believe is in heaven. Number one, the love of money is the root of all evil. He did not accept the money. And I asked the question, because I used to be this way. How many pastors have sold their vineyard out for money? How many pastors have sold their vineyard out for denominational um, uh, denominational uh, going up to up the denominational ranks. How many pastors and church members have sold their vineyard out for having a bigger church or having a, a, a larger, uh, um, you know, more more money on the church coffers or whatever? How many decisions have been made? In church meetings, board meetings, deacon meetings, pastor meetings, how many decisions have been made by church leaders to exchange the truth doctrine and the idea of the scriptures for a larger congregation? How many Rick Warren churches have sold out their church? How many elders and deacons and pastors have sold their church out to follow after the Rick Warren paradigm so they could get more money in the church coffers? How many of them have done that? And Rick Warren is no fan of the King James. In fact, he will tell you, use many translations. Use multiple translations. you got to have them all up there because people need to know, you know. How many churches have sold out for money? More money. A bigger congregation. A nicer building. The uh, family life uh, building that they put up. How many churches have done that? Most of them are doing that right now. They've sold out. Or, or they've bought into the bill of goods. That the King James is an inferior translation. It was shoddily put together by amateurs who sat around and uh, didn't know what they were doing. They, they, they didn't have access to the best or the better manuscripts. They were, they were relying upon this faulty Textus Receptus put together by Stephanus. And oh, by the way, did you know that King James was a homo? And they use all kinds of excuses. And they come up with this saying, well, now we have better manuscripts. Now we have uh, West Cotton Horde, who were godly men. They were pillars of the faith. And West Cotton Horde put together this new, this new Bible for us, and we've translated it afresh and new to update the language because it's all about language and words and things like that. And, and we now have better Bibles. The Message Bible, oh, it's a far better Bible than the King James. The NIV, of course it's better, because now God is no longer a he. And oh, the, I, well, I use the New American Standard Bible because it's the most accurate to the Greek and Hebrew. Really? And how do you know this? And so they have been sold the bill of goods that there are actually better Bibles out there, so let's go to that. And they have sold out their vineyard. And God bless you people who have not sold your vineyard for either a better one or for the, for the love of money. God bless you people. God bless you pastors. And they're still out there. God bless uh, you, you church leaders. God bless you older folk who sit in a church where you can see. You can see the, mu the music coming in. You can see the worldliness coming in. You can see the pastor changing everything in the church. And you're saying, you know what? I'll put up with the music. I'll put up with the pastor. I'll put up with all this stuff. But they're not taken. They can have my King James Bible when they pry it from my cold, dead hands. God bless you, people, for taking that kind of stand. And then you got surrounded. And, you, and they said, you either go along with us or you get out. And you had to leave your church. You had to leave your church that you paid thousands of dollars in tithes and offerings to get things done in that church, to put new carpet in that place, and to do things in that church that they needed done for the sake of the worship service and for the sake of the glory of God and saving souls. And you sunk your life into that church, and all of a sudden they said, we're going to a better Bible. Get out. Let me show you from the Bible this idea, and I did this in the uh, which Bible you 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 make you be the judge, but I'm going to put it in this aspect here. Remember, Naboth wanted, or excuse me, Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. Who, by the way, who got it for him? Jezebel. Go read that story. In fact, if you want to know the purpose of Mystery Babylon or Jezebel. You want to know her purpose, her function. God showed me this from the scriptures. Mike, this is who she is. This is how she operates. She is responsible for the transfer of authority. The authority of the vineyard was under Naboth, and there was no way around it. Jezebel said to Ahab, I'll get it for you. I'll get it for you. 
So she had to have Naboth killed in order for Ahab to confiscate the land, and that's what he did. In America, the transfer of authority from the Constitution to a dictatorship under Barack Hussein is being done by Mystery Babylon the Great. In the church, the transfer of authority uh, from the church being under the authority of the Bible or the King James Bible to some false authority of false translations or some spirit out there. Oh, I'm getting a new revelation from God. That's, that's Jezebel. That's Mystery Babylon the Great. Think of what happens in a home. The biblical head of a home is the husband. Is the mother of harlots taking away biblical authority in a home? That one's obvious. That's who she is, and that's how she operates. Here's what there are two vines clearly delineated in the scriptures, clearly defined in the scripture, two different vines. Here's the first one for Deuteronomy 32 For their vine is the vine of Sodom. And of the fields of Gomorrah. Now you think about that one for a minute. Their grapes are the grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine then. Now notice that he says the vine is the vine of Sodom. The grapes are the grapes of gall. Therefore their wine is the poison of dragons. And the cruel venom of asps is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures. And God is trying to teach us here. Number one, if the vine is from Sodom, if the underlying manuscripts came from the Vatican, through either the Sinaiticus, Mount Sinai, which was the monastery, or the Vaticanus, or Alexandrinus, or any of these, these main manuscripts, if the vine is from the Vatican then the grapes are going to be full of gall, and the wine is going to be poison. The wine is the spirit. Do you understand that? The vine is all, what vine did it come from? And if it came from the vine of the Vatican, if it came from the vine of Sodom, then the wine that is produced from that vine, the spirit that comes as a result of that vine, is going to be none other than the devil himself. That's the poison of dragons and the and the venom of snakes or asps. That's what the Bible's telling you. So the vine of the NIV, the New American Standard, the Message Bible, the Holman Standard Bible, the New King James Version, and every other version in the world other than the King James and its derivatives all have as their source the vine of Sodom. And God said, what, your, 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 your Bible came from Sodom? Your Bible came from that vine? Don't you know that you're drinking poison? Don't you know? This is why you won't go to church over here. This is why you won't sit in that congregation, and you won't take your kids there. This is why you sit at home on Sunday morning and turn Bethel Church on or Joel Osteen. No, just kidding or anybody else that's preaching the truth, and you won't take your kids to you because you said, you know what, I am not putting my kids in a Sunday school class or sit under a pastor where they're going to be fed poison. I won't do it. And God bless you for that, and he is blessing you for that. If you lose all your friends and all your relatives over this issue, good for you. You keep your stand because the devil will come and destroy your vine. He'll destroy your, your vineyard. Here's what John 15 says. Here's the other vine. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Who is the true vine? It's not Sodom. It's not Gomorrah. It's not the serpent. The true vine is Jesus Christ. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. That, by the way, let me stop right here. This is why, this is, this is why you had a rough day. This is why this is why no this is why you got into a little bit of sin here a while back. And God allowed it and the Holy Ghost came and whooped the fire out of you. And you got down on your face before Almighty God and said, God, I'm a wretched, low life sinner. I say I believe the Bible and I live like a heathen. God, would you, God, would you chasten me and correct me? And the Holy Ghost takes you and he you know what the husbandman starts doing? He starts clipping stuff off the vine. 
Boy, that's no good for you there. Boy, listen, and God, you know what God's saying? Boy, I'm going to make a good vine out of you. Boy, you're going to bear some fruit. You just wait and see. That's, that's what the true vine will do. That's what Jesus will do. That's what the Father will do as the husbandman. And you abide in that vine and you hang on, all right? God's got a blessing for you. But anyway, now in verse 3, now ye are clean. How? Through the word which I have spoken unto you. Look at the emphasis and the relationship between the vine, Christ, and the Bible. Now in verse 4, John 15, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Now, I want you to, I want you to focus now on what Christ is teaching here. He's teaching clearly that, and he said, number one, I'm the vine. You are the branches of that vine. You are, you are abiding in me, and if you abide in me, then you will bring forth much fruit. He said, now, you won't produce the fruit, because Christians don't produce fruit. They bear the fruit that the vine has produced, but we don't produce the fruit. We, it's not about our works. It's about Christ working through us. Now, here's what he continues to say in verse, uh, verse 6. The Bible says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. I want you to notice what happens to the branch that is withered and does not bear fruit. What happens to it? They are cast into the fire and burned. Now, look at Mark chapter 4, verse 14. Here's how the devil works. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and does what? taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. I want to go forward here for a second. I want you to look on this one to Luke 12. It's the one on the bottom. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, and uh, at lest they should believe and be saved. And so the Bible, let me, let me go to this here. The Bible is clearly teaching you. The devil has a responsibility, he has a job. His job is to take away the word. Now think about what we just heard John Piper say. He just said, how can we get the King James Bible out of this church? How can you as a pastor do it? And, it, and listen to what he said. He said it needs to be done. It needs, he didn't just say, now, I don't have a problem with the King James. If you want to use it, use it. That's not what he said. Now, he said, now show it respect and talk nice about it and don't ever say bad things about it. But he didn't say, now, if the church is King James and they're using the King James, leave them alone. He didn't say that. He said, it's got to be taken away. People need to understand there is a better Bible out there. Let's, let's abandon the King James and let's go to these new Bibles. But he never said, leave it in there. Do you know why he didn't say that? The spirit that is evident in him hates the word of God, hates the King James Bible. It hates it. The spirit that is in anyone who will look at a congregation or a Bible study group, or, or, or you for that matter, and say, you really need to get an NIV. You really need to get a New American Standard. You need to get away from it. Nobody ever says to you, oh, you use the King James. I think that's great. I think the King James is a wonderful translation. I, you know what? Hang on to that. No one's ever said that to you. 
They've all they've all lied to you. They've all mocked you. They've all made fun of you. They have provoked you. They have tried to they've tried to get you away from that Bible. What spirit is it that tries to get the word out of you? What spirit is that? That is not the Holy Spirit of God. It's not. The, and here Piper talks out of both sides of his mouth. I think the King James is a great gift. Uh, there are better Bibles. We need to get the King James out of there. You know what he is? He's double-minded man. He's double-tongued. Him speak with forked tongue, Kimosabi. That's what he does. He's not telling you the truth. You cannot say on one hand, I think the King James Bible is a great gift. Hang on to it. And then come out and say, we need to get rid of it. And that's what he did. The devil and the spirit of the dragon is responsible for removing the word out of your life, out of your family, out of your children, out of your marriage, out of our colleges and universities, out of our pulpits, out of our Bible study groups. You've been to Bible study groups. So they, have, they have mocked you. They have, they have uh, scorned you and told you, uh, listen, we don't want to use that King James Bible. You need to, if you're going to be part of us, you have, to bring an, uh, you have to bring a message in here. You bring the original Greek and Hebrew. You bring any number of things. Just don't bring a King James Bible in here. They don't want you around. What spirit is that? Back to, uh, back to Mark chapter 4. Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake immediately, they are offended. Um, let, me, uh, let me go back to this one here. So the, the object of the devil, I've got so many slides up here, I can't remember which one I was going to next. The object of the devil is to remove the word of God away from you. Why? Because you then become unfruitful. And what? And, and again, clearly in the Bible, what happens to unfruitful people? They're to be cut down and cast into the fire, and the devil knows this. And so the good ground are the people who said, you know what? This is my vineyard right here. I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to believe it. And God brings forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. That's the good ground people. Um, let me, uh, you know, I'm, miss, I'm missing a passage out of here, and I don't know what happened to it, but I, I think it's, I want us to, let me, let me do this. Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Excuse me, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. This is what I wanted to get to. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Now, if you had any, and I want you to write this down, if you had any doubt in your mind about the King James Bible, ask yourself this question. Ask yourself, why are they trying to remove the King James out of our churches, out of our colleges, out of our universities? Why are they trying to get, why did they a hundred years ago move away from the received text or the majority text? Why did they do that? Why is it that all of a sudden, oh wow, all of a sudden now new manuscripts pop up? Really? Why did that happen? Because devils hate the word of God. They hate it. They can't stand it. And if it's the real word of God, devils, remember, they're like beasts. There's some, there's some places a beast will not go into. They cannot, they cannot handle that. And that's what these devils are when it comes to the real, genuine word of God. I guarantee you that they know the difference. The Bible scholars and the, and the preachers and the theologians and the Bible study teachers, they may pretend like there's really no difference, but I guarantee you devils know the difference, don't they? Uh, there was something that I, that I uh, didn't have up on the screen out of John chapter, uh, John chapter 15 in this teaching uh, concerning the, the abiding in the branch and, and Jesus being the branch. He said in John chapter 15, verse 7, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. That is the promise of God. My words abide in you. 
And the devil does not want the words abiding inside of you because it makes him nervous. It makes him uncomfortable. He can't work. He can't operate. He can't function. He cannot deceive. He cannot pull down. He cannot destroy. He cannot steal. Uh, steal. He cannot lie to you and your family and your children because you have the words of God from the true vine, Jesus Christ. You have them. And the devil does not like those words and he will stop at nothing to get those words removed and taken out of the way. That's his job. And again, I, I just want to illustrate this. We have two spirits that are working against each other. The spirit of God and the spirit of the serpent. The spirit of God hates the spirit of the serpent. The spirit of the serpent hates the spirit of God. They will, they will never get along. They will never like each other. It's, and you cannot reconcile them, even though most people, most churches are trying to reconcile the two. They, it will not happen. And if you, after knowing the truth, and after your heart is telling you that the King James is right, your heart is telling you that it is, you settle just to be part of the Bible study group you settle and you decide that you're not going to make an issue of it because you don't want to make waves, but you want to stay in the fellowship. You want to stay in the Bible study group. And you just decide that from now on you're going to keep your mouth shut and you're not going to make waves and you're not going to, you're just going to agree to disagree. That won't last very long. Because any time that you're going to be silent about this or any of these other important issues, at some point the devil using those people are going to convince you. They're going to, they're going to make it that their fellowship to you is worth more than the words that are in your Bible. And he wins. It's dangerous. The devil cannot handle the words. Jesus cast out devils. With what? He didn't have a magic potion. He didn't have a wand. He didn't ride around on a broom like Harry Potter. He didn't have a he didn't have a Ghostbusters gun that zzzz. he didn't have that. He had his words and his words made devils leave and they couldn't do what they're going to do. There's one devil in particular. There's one spirit in particular that can listen to me now and, and, and think about this. There's one spirit in particular that cannot operate as long as the word of God is in place. Let me show you this. Take your Bible. Uh, let's see here. Take your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 7. Make a note of this. This, If you want to believe in conspiracies, here's the conspiracy. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 6. Let us go up against Judah. Judah is, a, is the church. It's a picture of the church. Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst, midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Now, here's, here's why I'm saying this. Let us go up against Judah. Let's vex it. You know what vexation is? It's when they work on you, and 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 finally they accomplish what they want to. It's kind of like it's kind of like the guy who who he just you know he's married he's got three kids at home he's just going to stop off for a drink on his way home and uh, you know his wife and kids are out shopping so he's just going to stop off for a drink and there's some gal there that's making a pretty eye at him on the one hand he wants to keep his marriage together he doesn't he loves his wife he loves his kids he knows the consequences of doing uh, anything wrong but on the other hand here's a woman that's interested in him now what he should do is get up and leave. What he should do is just get away from that and stay far, far away from that. But remember, Jezebel is a spirit working to remove biblical authority, the husband, out of the home. And so this woman's just going to make pretty eyes at it. Every time he looks her way, she's looking at him. She ha you know what she has? She has eyes full of adultery. That's why, and, and I'll, I'll say this, and I, listen, you, you, just, you just think about this. You ladies out there or you men, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're, you're walking through the store, or you're down at the mall, or you're at the county fair, or you're at whatever, and your eyes lock on a good-looking man or a good-looking woman. 
and those eyes of that woman or that man is looking back at you. You know what? You know you listen. You know exactly what that is. Those are eyes that have adultery in them, and you know it. The best thing for you to do is turn your head or get out of that situation. But she's going to keep working on this guy, and she's going to keep working on him and working on him and working on him. She's going to try to get his email. She's going to try to get his phone number so she can text him. She's going to keep working. You know what she's doing? She's vexing him. She's going to keep vexing him until he's in bed with her. That's what Potiphar's wife was trying to do, vexing Joseph until he did what she wanted him to do. And I want to tell you something. You sit in these churches, you sit in these Bible study groups, you go to you go to this particular fellowship or you're in this denomination, they are going to they're going to vex you until you give in or get out, one of the two. But they're not going to be satisfied with your presence there as long as you have this Bible. Remember, the spirit that is with them hates this book. They don't even want you showing up. They they don't even want you in your church if they can't control you. And so they're going to vex you, and they're going to work on you. And then all of a sudden now, watch this, a breach is going to open up. You see, this Bible is a firewall. It's a wall. It's salvation. It's a wall built around your soul and your family and your church or whatever, your country. It's a wall of protection built around you. And all they have to do with that massive wall that's there, all they have to do is, is put one little hole in there. Let's set a breach therein. Let's, let's get it in your mind. Now listen to this. Here's how this, here's how this works. Let's get it in your mind. And if you go back and watch this video from John Piper, was that his name, John Piper? You go back and watch this video. He is teaching you the principle that I just told you. He's teaching you, number one, you, you do it nicely, you do it subtly, you put your arm around them and pretend like they're friends, but you vex them until they go your way. You vex them and, to, and, you, and you try to cause a breach in them and get them, to, all they have to do, watch this now, all they have to do is move slightly to the left or slightly to the right. That's all they have to do. You know what the New King James Bible was? A breach. It was a breach Bible. It was one step slightly to one degree to the left or to the right to get Bible believing, Bible standing, Bible preaching churches to breach and open up one little one little area. And that's all it takes. Now that the Bible is out of the way. The spirit of the Antichrist, that king, can be established as an authority. Remember? Remember what Jezebel does. She removes biblical authority. The biblical the authority in our church is the King James Bible. And if I'm not diligent on this issue, if I'm not teaching on this issue. If I don't go after people who take an opposite stand on this issue, there will be sheep in my fold that they'll be able to breach and set another king in there, another authority besides the King James Bible. And listen, I, I, want, to, I want to tell you how it sounds. This is how it sounds. The, the, the preacher's reading or the Bible study leader or whatever is, or, or, or the Christian radio guy or the the prophecy website that you're reading that you say oh then they got so much good information on there oh wow now they don't always use the king james that's see that's what it sounds like the breach the, the breach sounds like this a better translation says this and because they have set you up in their in their dialogue with this great big wonderful thought that you go Wow, that's like so cool. You know, I wonder if this is true or not. And then they tell you, they give you a verse now out of the NIV or the New American Standard or whatever, or out of the original Hebrew and Greek. They give you some, you know what they're doing? They're setting you up. They set you up with this wonderful thought that you want to embrace, and then they give you a verse from another Bible or a retranslated original Greek and Hebrew that matches exactly what they said. And now you go, well, you know, I guess maybe, the, you know, the Hebrew is right there. Maybe, or maybe the New American Standard, maybe it does have some good stuff in it. Boom! It's, they got you. They got you is what they did. 
and I and I'm, I'm I'll say this nicely to you because I don't I don't want to make people mad. I, if you if you send me information and all that stuff, man, I appreciate it. Um, don't ask me to go read some website where it's got some big prophecy thing on there if they're not using the King James Bible. Don't I'm not gonna I am not gonna waste my time. I won't read it. I don't trust it. I don't trust the people who wrote it. I don't trust the verses they're go they're going to use, and so therefore I will not trust their conclusions. And I don't care how close you say that they say what I'm saying. All they have to do in your mind is get you to think, well, maybe the King James isn't right all the time. That's all they have to do. Or how about, uh, let's see here, how about this one? Joshua chapter 10. I'm going to show you this. Remember the, remember the five kings and what they represent, those devils in uh, Revelation chapter 9 coming out at the fifth trumpet. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hid in a cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave, and set men by, by it for to keep them. Now I'm going to ask you a question. As long as those five kings, now think of kings, authority. As long as those kings are in that cave, and those stones are holding those kings in, what can they do? Nothing. You know what? They're bound. They're, they're locked up. They have no control. They have no authority. They have no force. They cannot do it. The, the Antichrist right now, where is he? He's down in the cave, isn't he? What can he do? Nothing. He can't do a thing because he's locked up. He's bound in the pit. He's in the cave. And what's holding him in there? What is holding him in there? the stones you want to you want to see what the bible says about that first peter chapter 2 to whom coming as unto a living stone who's the living stone it's jesus he is the living stone as opposed to a carved image stone that's a dead stone by the way to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of god and precious ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices ex acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Look at that. No confusion whatsoever. You just believe the Bible. The very next verse, verse 7, says this, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Do you understand, do you understand now? What is withholding the Antichrist from being revealed? What's withholding him from working? What it is that is keeping him where he is? Do you understand what it is? It's Christ. It's his living word. It's you as lively stones who believe the word of God. You believe it from the true vine of Jesus Christ. His words abide in you. And you are like the stone of Jesus Christ who build up the house of God. You are those, because you believe this book, you are the stones that are holding that guy in. And the devil and the Illuminati and the powers that be, they want those guys out of there. How are they going to get them out? They're removing one stone at a time. How many churches did you know 40 years ago that were lively stones? They believed in the true vine, the Jesus Christ, the King James Bible. And they don't anymore. And then the denomination that used to stand on the word of God got their doctrines from the King James Bible. And then that lineage, that line, that vine, 
they don't believe it anymore. And those preachers you knew, they don't believe it anymore. And the church you grew up in, they don't believe it anymore. And now there's just a few stones left, but they still believe. And the men who were standing by the cave, that's God's men, and they're not moving. They're not backing up. They're standing their ground. They say, you know what? We serve a purpose here on this earth. You can hate us. You can despise us. You can mock us. You can call us names. You can try to ruin our reputation. You can call us a cult. You can do whatever you want to, but we're not moving. Because we know what's in that pit. And we're not gonna we're not gonna move until God Himself moves us, and He will. But we're not moving. The lively stones, when the lively stones, when those stones are taken out of the way, then that guy's gonna come out. He's gonna do his work. Let me show you this uh, in real life. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 17, the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there had, this is in the days of Eli, and the Ark of the Covenant had been taken. The, the Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he had made mention of the Ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward. He, there was a falling away, wasn't there? And what was, he made mention, the ark of God is taken. He fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died, for he was an old man, and he weighed, weighed as much as Mike Hoggart or more, and he had judged Israel for 40 years. What was in the ark of the covenant? Aaron's rod that budded, the, uh, the pot of manna, and what? The word of God. The word of God, watch this now, in, in the land of Israel, the word of God was taken out of the way. Look what happened right after that happened. There was a falling away. The, the, it, the word of God was taken out of the way. Look what happened right after that. His daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child near to be delivered, and when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law, her husband, were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because her father-in-law and her husband. What is the significance of the ark of God being taken and the woman giving birth to a child, a travailing woman giving birth to a child and Eli falling backward? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no man deceive you by any means. Don't let John Piper convince you that you need to have a better Bible. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship. <coughs> Excuse me. So that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. There it is right there. Now you know what is holding him back. It's all you pesky King James Bible believers, you part of a cult, you idol worshipers, because you worship the word of God. I do. I certainly do. I worship the Word. Do you know why? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I worship that Word, and I will die for that Word, and maybe that's what they've got in mind. And so you just ask yourself the question, why? I mean, I don't, I don't hear, I didn't, I did not hear John Piper. I did not hear John Piper say in this video, well, what if they're using the English Standard Version? 
And surely there are better translations. Why don't we, uh, let's talk about how to get your church out of the English Standard Version and into the Message Bible. He didn't say, uh, have you ever, have you ever heard any pastor say, I know we're all using, I know we're all using the, uh, the NIV, but um, I, I want to try to get us out of the NIV into the Message Bible. No. You know why? Because all of those spirits that are working in opposition to the King James Bible, they all know, like this, the NIV and the New American Standard and the Message and the New King James, they all know, who's, they all know whose team they play on. They all know that they're all, they're all part of it. And you don't hear pastors saying about any other translation in the world, ah, we need, I, I just think we need to get out of the uh, New American Standard and try to get into the, the, you know, the message or something like that. Uh-uh, they don't do that. John Piper didn't say that. He said, King, he said we got to get them out of the King James. Why the King James? Why? You have to ask yourself the question, why? Why are they trying to get us out of the King James? It's because it's the true vine. It's the living stone that is withholding that spirit right now. But one of these days, that spirit's going to be taken out of the way. And it's not going to withhold anymore. And then Ichabod's going to be born. That's the man of sin, the glorious departed. That's the son of perdition. That's who, that's who Ichabod represents. The whole scenario is drawn out for you right there. And so I'm going to tell you people. Now, if you're listening to me and uh, you're going to mock and scorn and everything else in the world, do so. I Listen, you're not chasing me away. I'm not running from you. I'm not afraid of you. I don't care about your hurt feelings. I don't, nothing like that. I mean, I, yeah, I care about hurt feelings. If you cry in front of me, I will feel bad. Okay? But as far as you saying, now, now Mike, um, I, I, I'm, you're an idiot. You're a cult leader. And I'm, I'm going to say this because he said it. He said it. Rob Skiba said that the King James only crowd are a cult. That was to me. He wrote that to me. It doesn't scare me. It doesn't make me feel bad. I was an outcast in school. I'm used to it, and I'm sticking with the Word of God because I know what it does. I know the power that's in the words of this book. They are the words that Jesus used, and the devils don't like them. I know that any time that the devils are all over me, I know that I go to the King James Bible, and they're gone. That's what I know. Stand with me. Will you? I have some emails. Jelly says that the Bible teacher is using the King James but reads it without these and thous, etc. What do we do? Um, I find it harder to remember scriptures when they aren't read correctly. By the way, I love it when you read. No mistakes because you believe in the importance of every word. Thank you. Uh, Jill, the these and thous have a grammatical purpose to it. They're, they're actually not telling you the truth when they will not use the these and the thous. The is second person singular. You is second person plural. See the difference? So if, if Jesus, says to, Jesus says to thee, ye, or, or um, thou shalt have eternal life, he is speaking directly to thee, second person singular, and he means that thee alone, if you believe, will have eternal life. If he were to say you, he would be insinuating the whole crowd. And that's, that's inaccurate. It's not right. And so even the these and thous have a doctrinal importance in being there. That's how we know. You see, Jill, um, I don't know how it is in England. But in America, because we don't use thee and thou anymore, we have to differentiate when we say you. This is why 
in in um, in New Jersey, it's use guys use. In uh, uh, certain places up north, it's yuns, yuns, you ones, plural. Down in the south, everybody say it with me. Y'all, hey, how y'all doing? I never talked to one person and said, hey, y'all, they're going to go. This is why. We've had to add stuff to our language because we don't use the and thou anymore. It's a good question, and I appreciate it. Uh, Dan, hey, Dan, love you, man. I saw your picture. I pre- oh, what a beautiful family. God bless you, buddy. Uh, amen, you're coming in loud and clear. Some pastors snarled at the King James Bible, and Dan knew exactly. Dan was over here in Illinois in Assembly of God Church and was asked, was told, was demanded by his pastor not to use the King James Bible anymore. And Dan said, we're out. We're out. We're done. Anyway, Tracy, uh, my dad and I come to major differences in discussing doctrines in the Bible, for he uses the uh, contemporary Bible while I use the King James only. Even when I point out the differences, he doesn't see it. He says that he researched it, and it is an accurate version. I hate that. How can I deal with this issue in love? Well, he's your dad. Okay, Uh, You can't hit him. You can't spit on him. You can't beat him up. He's your dad. Okay, uh, you love him, and and I'll say this, Tracy. Okay, number one, keep giving him the words because the words of the scripture they have the power. You don't. You won't be able to lay out some some chart that shows where all the manuscripts came from and say, now now, Dad, follow this now. And this is going to convince you. You won't be able to do that. What you will be able to do is give him the words of the King James. Let him hear it. Let him hear it when you sing it. Sing the words of the King James. When when he's in, a, when you're in a conversation with him, he'll say, "Well, you know, just friendly conversation." Well, you know, the, Dad, the Bible says, and give him some King James verse that is relevant to what you're talking about. Hopefully, eventually, hopefully, eventually, the Word of God will uh, will win over. Rebecca, Pastor Mike, I just want to thank you again for sharing the truth of God's Word to us. You'll be happy to hear that I have left the Charismaniac Church. Woo! Amen! That I attended for over 15 years after hearing the real truth of God's word from your teaching. It's hard for me to believe that sometimes that I had no idea of what the truth really was. Now I realize, if I'm to be honest, that I, like many Christians, was allowing others to study for me. Boy, that is a good statement, Rebecca. Wow. That is, that is awesome. Uh, I was letting them study for me. Uh, and I took the word of man over the precious word of God. Now I, now that I am studying for myself, I can totally see what my eyes were blind to before. I can never thank you enough for giving me the cold, hard truth. I will be eternally grateful to you. Uh, for you. Just give God the thanks, all right? Uh, without it, I'd be, I'm just the vessel that he's using, but I appreciate what you're saying. I was able to find a King James Bible Baptist church about an hour from my home, but I don't mind the drive. I'll drive anywhere now for the real truth of God's word. And I have to tell you, though, it has not been without persecution from those that used to love me. It has changed things. Those that I used to be close friends with that still go to that church seem to avoid me like the plague. They truly feel like I'm being led astray now. I can just see now that they look at me with pity as if I'm now being deceived and walking away from God. It makes me very sad. See, I told you, the persecution people, fasten your seatbelts. The persecution is going to come from the church people, the Bible study people that you're communing and fellowshipping with. That's who it's going to come from. They're going to turn on you. She said, uh, you and your family will remain in my prayers. Again, I'm eternally grateful for your ministry. I'm sharing with as many people as I can. Rebecca, that's exactly. And, and Rebecca, you're not copying our videos, are you? <laughs> that's what we want you to do. All right. Anyway, um, uh, Forrest from Maui. Hi, Mike. That First Kings 21 sermon by Reg Kelly, When Dogs Bark, is one of the sermons that convict a man. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Zafnath Pa'aniya says, King James is the only Bible that is not copyrighted that should expose who is behind the other versions. They do not call the devil Slewfoot for nothing. I don't know who Slewfoot is. And by the way, Zephnath Pioneer, the King James is copyrighted in the United Kingdom, and there's a reason for it. 
As long as there is a monarch in England, the Bible cannot be altered. Uh, Christine, hi, Pastor Mike. I've heard the step one garbage from the pulpit and know exactly what you're talking about. I appreciate that, Christine. Danny, uh, oily, condescending, liberal sneak, sneak oil NIV salesman, pie-eyed piper, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. They will not endure sound doctrine just like every liberal church I was raised in. By the way, I didn't get to. I did not get to. Uh, on his website, and I don't have time for it today, Desiring God, there's a feature article on there on John Piper's website called How to Watch the Hobbit. Wait for it. Wait for it. Here it is. And let me get rid of that stupid thing up at the top. There we go. Okay. Listen for the echoes of the gospel. And look at what he says here at the bottom paragraph. Finding Jesus in the Hobbit doesn't mean shoehorning Gandalf or Bilbo or anyone else into some Christ mold, but following the story, truly tracking its twist, feeling its angst, and knowing that the turn, the great unexpected rescue, just in the nick of time, the place where our souls are most stirred and relieved and satisfied. Listen to, listen to what he said now. Is tapping into something deep within us. I didn't say that. He said it. And you, now you know. Now you know that spirit. It's all about, you know, get away from the King James now. Now we get it. Now let's watch The Hobbit. And let's find in this esoteric story how to tap into something that's deep inside of us. The center point. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see here. Uh, DP says, you are assuming that John Piper is fully aware that he is consciously using a center point logo. Really? Uh, you, you know you have a reverse of this on your daily broadcast online box with four arrows pointing out of the center point. Surely you aren't secretly bowing down to this. What in the world? Your daily broadcast online box. Anyway, why didn't the KJV translators in 1611 hold to the same view and inerrancy for their translation as the original Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew like KJV only adherents do? Is it possible that they would never infer infallibility on their translation equal to the original scriptures? Uh, DP, who cares? Who cares? Who cares what they thought? Who cares what they said? What I care about is what God said. And God said his words are pure. God said his words are right. God said his words would not pass away. God said his words were the, were the, were the keys to eternal life. God said that his words chase devils away. God said there would never be an error in the Bible. Error. Doesn't matter what a translator said or thought. It doesn't matter. What matters to me and what, what should matter to you, DP, is the fact that the word of God must be inerrant. And if it's the inerrant word of God, then why should we go to a better one? And I say that in love. Dan Bourne says, good show, no improvement needed of the word. This should be a reminder to all, if they want to say many Bibles to be popular, then they have to be of the world and of the world only. The word is only one and does not need improvement, does not need to grow grapes in the vine. It's tasty. I love its fruit as it is. Danny, you got it right. I love you. I got to go now. God bless you. Keep our family in your prayers. We love you. Watchman broadcast coming out this Sunday. We will see you later, alligator.